So I've spent the last couple of days wire wheeling, sanding, grinding, cleaning up some welds, uh, the underside of the car. Um, the floor pans and the trunk pans are all new. Um, the rear floor pan to the back seat under the seat is the only existing sheet metal that stayed in. Everything else is new. Um, previous video showed the top version of it as well as all the um, prep and care I gave to the uh, the struts, uh, the support struts that go uh, left and right between the uh, between the rockers. Um, this is the underside. Um, everything that went in, as far as sheet metal went, was either weld prime, uh, weldable primer, or actual um, auto primer um, before being welded in. Welded in, and then I came back and. With the frame out of the way, was able to wire wheel where the frame attaches. There's a, a, a tab um, that a, a body mount goes around and then through the frame and holds on. There's also same up front, um, although that's a through bolt. And so what I did was I just was able to wire wheel everything. Oh, that's that's dust from dusty hands touching. Uh, wire wheeled everything and then put on the um, uh, rust encapsulator uh, nasty goo uh, used an Eastwood brand on that and boy does it smell nasty and it bites into really any surface and um, is going to be my finish under there. Um, after the sheet metal welding to the struts I went ahead and also decided to use seam sealer, automotive seam sealer, to tighten up everything. So the, the bottom of this thing actually can take a lot of moisture, uh, more so than the original um, construction, and nothing's going to get in um, and sit in there. There's holes on the low spots uh, in the eventuality that it does, but I took away all the openings between the sheet metal and the struts um, all the way through and um, seam sealed that and then gooed the whole bottom of it with that uh, rust encapsulator, which also bites on to paint, primer, bare metal, everything. Um, so we've got, this is the area, uh, get a little better view here, where the rear axle goes, which when the frame is on, you can't even begin to get in there very easily. Some spots are just completely off limits to your hands and some you can get in there. Uh, so that's all clean, uh, ready to go. Uh, interior wheel wells, I, had, I went ahead and wire wheeled those um, to whatever was super secure and then resprayed with the rubberized uh, wheel well under coating. Um, and we'll paint those later, but I wanted to get the rubberized mess on there while the wheel was out. Um, here's the trunk section with that trap door under the gas tank. And then a fun little wood bracket bolted screwed and everything so that it could actually sit on frame locations not be near the body parts and then clamped on to the lift and that turned out to be pretty easy um, and then under here all just watertight and sealed up really good so frame is going on today um, maybe for the last time, but I kind of doubt it. Um, I'd like to not have to remove it again, and I don't think I need to. Um, some stuff will be easier to do with the frame out, but frankly, I'm running out of space to work comfortably, so I'm going to bring that thing in here, finish up a couple of details on the rear axle, uh, brake lines uh, to left and right rear uh, can be bent up eas much easier and just sitting here. Um, with the axle exposed, so I might do that first. But I'm gonna, my plan today is to wheel that in and get that made it up and nice and uh, secure and hopefully not take it off again. All right, thanks for watching and more to come. So here's the differential on the build another 68 Chevelle. It is a 10 volt that has been upgraded with some features to hopefully withstand to about 450 horsepower. Um, the internet geniuses out there uh, said this was the way to go if you had to stick with the 10 bolt. 
And since this car is probably going to be destined for about 400 horsepower maximum, this felt like a decent way to go, short of spending a small fortune trying to either source a Ford rear end or a uh, 12 bolt. So I went this way. Um, the first upgrade staring you right in the face is that uh, Mosier uh, cast aluminum uh, cover, which also acts as a uh, bearing cap uh, um, support. Probably using the wrong terminology there, but that's the point. These guys here are set against the um, bearing caps and torqued very specifically. And the only thing I would complain about, which really is not a big deal because it was a reasonably priced cover, was that these bolts, uh, these uh, cap head um, bolts came in a mild steel, which uh, surface rust rusted pretty quickly. Um, yes, I could have painted them, didn't think about it. So went down to the hardware store, bought some stainless ones. So that is costing a little more. And then the other thing I had to do was make a little altered bracket to hold the brake T distribution part there um, and have actually put a stud in there, if you can see, um, with a bolt behind it, torquing it so the cover's still doing its job and then using the stud to mount that. So that's the only change. Um, the other upgrade I did to the axles was new, harder uh, 32 spline axles. Um, and welded the tubes on, um, which was um, kind of fun. Preheat, weld, uh, no big deal, cool it slower, um, worked out fine, wrapped it with um, insulation blanket, if you will, to kind of slow the cooling. So hopefully those are strong. Um, and then as you can see, the QA1 and disc brake conversions are all in there. Um, and Oh yeah, I still have to add the bump stops. I need to put those back on. But uh, what I did yesterday was uh, bend up some brake lines and weld on those little tabs um, for the uh, for the hard line to fle uh, stainless flex line. And did that, decided to paint them just to make them all go away. And there we go. So that is the upgraded 10 bolt differential and uh, hopefully that works out. Thanks. So here's the length I'll go to. This is the bolt and retainer system for the gas tank straps. Of course, the original ones were rusted out and destroyed. So I had some stainless steel all thread and decided to make my own because I'm tired of them getting rusty. So uh, welded that up, bought new retainers, and uh, yeah. So I will paint the... Uh, um, head of the bolts, but uh, that's the length I'm going to. Okay, welcome back. So, part of doing a modern engine swap into an older carbureted car is changing the fuel system. And what you see there is the back line, which is wrapped in spring, is the brake line uh, that goes to the rear wheels. And the two other lines are one of them is the fuel supply line and the other one is a return line. And the fuel pump is sitting inside the gas tank and giving constant pressure up to the engine. And the gas that is not used is sent back to the uh, fuel tank in the return line. And sometimes they have a system that's called a deadhead where it's one line sending pressure to the uh, injector rails on the intake manifold and uh, it does not have a return system and the only downside to that is the fuel can get warm because it's sitting in the line waiting to be used as opposed to circulating which tends to keep it cooler um, and the every all of the internet geniuses back when I did the first car um, it sounded like doing return lines were the way to go so Running two lines, since you're running a new line anyway, um, larger capacity, clean, no rust in it. Um, running a second line didn't seem to be that much of a strain, so I did that and the uh, first car runs great, so I'm doing the same thing with this one. So, running those lines, is, as I mentioned in an earlier uh, video, was much easier to do on the frame with the body off. And so what you see there is the section from where the gas tank will be, 
um, fed through a tight cavity, well protected, and now it needs to run down the frame um, and then we'll come up the firewall. I've got them cut there now so that I can locate them exactly uh, once I have the engine bay more under control, but getting them secured and safe and tucked out of the way in here is what I'm working on now. Um, I boxed the frame, so the frame doesn't have a C-channel anymore where I could tuck those where I did on the first car, that one. And on this one, they need to run along that rail. Um, this is the transmission mount uh, cross member, or not cross member, but that's where the cross member will bolt onto. So they need to ride up high in there. So what I've done is made some brackets and set up some hardware to secure them. And that's what I'm showing you now. So here is a stud coming out of the frame that will secure a bracket. Here are two more. Um, uh, press nuts, if you will. They go in um, kind of like a reverse popper of it, if you will. It's a nut inside there, squeezed in from the backside. Um, and then a stud or a bolt can go in there. Uh, another one here. This one's not painted yet. And then it runs up high, and then there'll be another one here. So what we're doing... Oh, and a fuel filter is nice to get in there. And I, in the last car, I tucked it into that C-channel. This time, with it being boxed in, um, I decided to make a bracket to protect the fuel pump. And that is this guy here. And what happens is that is screwed in up here and will sit like that. And the fuel pump will be inside with a flex line on the back end going from that fitting um, to the fuel filter. And that will allow replacement of it. You need to, if I had two solid lines on each side, it'd mean, it would mean bending to get the fuel filter out. And with one flex line on the back side, it'll allow some, some wiggability to get off the fuel filter and put on a new one. And then the new uh, line will go from there up to the front. So how this works is the fuel filter sits in here and First, the fuel filter is bolted up into the, or not bolted, but uh, attached onto the fuel lines, and then this bracket can slide in over it, which will give it protection from uh, road damage, and will sit like that, fitting in and out. And again, a flex line in the back, and then a solid line going out to the front, and secured. So the kind of system I'm using to secure it is brackets that I've been making that are essentially that. So that guy will sit on that stud, hold those lines exactly where I want them, wrapped in rubber so that the lines are not vibrating up against the steel frame but have a little bit of a um, gasket, if you will, there, just a shock absorber. And I will show more once that's bolted together. So here is the tail section, kind of sort of finished product. Um, bracket in place, holding supply line, which has the AN fittings on it. Behind it is the return line, and the very top wrapped in spring is the brake. All held nice and secure. Um, flex line uh, allows um, some flex so that when that fuel filter behind the bracket comes out, um, easy enough to replace. Bracket is bolted on and then there is an AN male fitting sitting out the front of the fuel filter that once I have more firewall figured out I will continue to run the supply line above those, I'm sorry, on top of those two. Swing around here and up the firewall which is how I did the first car. Anyway those little details, um, I think, are actually pretty big because it's very easy to throw fuel line and just tech screw it wherever you want and watch it wear through, watch it get kinked, watch all sorts of little long-term problems. And building these things, I really want to make them future-proof. I want you to be able to work on them, um, replace parts as needed, um, this whole line system could easily be upgraded if it needed to be if someone decided to put some monstrous turbo in here. 
Um, it'd be very easy to run one more return line, use these two as supply, and um, be able to go through thousands of gallons of gas in a turbo or some other boosted system. Anyway, but uh, figuring out all these mounting points when you're doing alterations is just a kind of a subtle detail that I think is actually pretty important for the longevity of the car. And uh, so there we are. Thought I'd show a couple minutes of that and see you next time. Coming up in the next video, you'll see uh, this vehicle getting scrapped uh, of its engine, transmission, wiring harness, some accessories that need to go with it. This is a 2003 Chevy Tahoe. It has a 5.3 liter engine in it and a 4L60E transmission. And I'll be taking that out. Um, this vehicle, while it looks uh, halfway presentable here, is actually completely vandalized and trashed on the inside. Uh, broken glass all the way around the back side of it. Uh, lots of all the panels are dented So it, while it looks like hey, how come not you just don't fix this up and sell it or something? Um, it's really it's quite trashed the uh, whole dashboard is destroyed. So it was uh, gonna get junked anyway So I took a chance bought this thing um, sight unseen literally uh, because I had heard about the engine was uh, had clean oil and the transmission had clean oil I went and checked it out uh, everything proved to be as advertised and bought it, brought it home, had to put a starter motor in it and do some wiring um, to get it to run, but started up uh, right away and did a compression test. Everything was uh, consistent, so it made sense. Um, and after all the parts come out, uh, it's going to the metal scrapyard. So say bye-bye Chevy Tahoe. Um, thanks for watching. Um, if you like it, give me a thumbs up. Uh, comment please if you can if you're interested if you have questions and if you subscribe make sure to turn on the notifications the little bell uh, on the subscribe part uh, that will give you an email when I post new videos and thanks for watching